We're all familiar by now with Jamie's mental health awareness Shabbat. This is something which Bushy specifically has championed for um, as long as Jamie has put it forward to the communities. And we've taken many different and varied ways of trying to raise awareness for the importance of positive mental health, the removing stigma around challenges with mental health, health creating parity um, for, um, for individuals and to ensure that there is a safe space to talk about these things in our communities. We were not going to allow COVID this year to get in the way of ensuring that once again, this very, very critical and important period of the year, highlighting mental health awareness will be featured prominently in our community. And I am so thrilled and so pleased to see the take up by all of you on a midweek coming here and sharing with us what I'm sure will be a really important and meaningful evening. So I just want to begin by saying thank you to all of you for recognizing how important mental health and the conversations around mental health are for all of us and how important it is to be featured in our show calendar beyond all the things we do throughout the year to create positive mental health and offer support as well. But specifically, what we have featured for you this evening is something quite unique and quite special. Uh, Luciana Berger has been a champion of mental health, um, both um, whilst she has been um, over the years a, a member of parliament um, and since then as well has continuing to campaign for the importance of, uh, of mental health in various arenas. Um, it, is no, it is no secret that Luciana herself has been on the front lines of having to deal with challenges as well, which has, um, which has been in the arena of mental health, which I'm sure she'll also bring into the conversation and into her presentation this evening as well. Luciana is a very, very busy and a, a very um, sought after um, speaker. She's come to us in Bushy this evening and she's come without taking any honorarium or um, and by making herself completely accessible because of how important she feels the work that Jamie does is. And we're very proud as a show that we will um, be giving a donation to Jamie as a, as a thank you to Luciana for coming and joining us this evening. It's also important that the conversations that she's going to share with us will be shared as well further afield um, by those who are not able to be here this evening. Of course, it will be recorded, but please, um, especially to those from the younger generations, I know it's very important to her to raise awareness and to encourage volunteering in, in the younger generations as well. And um, I really am sure that this is something that could be communicated, but also shared by all of us as well. Uh, Luciana has been a tremendous friend um, and very proud Jew amongst the Anglo Jewry, um, especially over the years. It is such a privilege and such a treat that she has joined us um, this evening. And therefore, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Luciana. It'll be followed by a time for Q&As afterwards, but please, ladies and gentlemen, on the virtual plane, um, put your hands together for Luciana Berger. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much, um, Rabbi, for that incredibly kind and warm welcome. And it really is a pleasure and a privilege to join you all this evening and um, to um, have a discussion in advance of uh, and in the week of Jamie's 
Mental Health Shabbat, um, a great and fantastic campaign that has gone only from strength to strength. And sadly, this year is hampered by COVID-19 and the pandemic in terms of the specific events itself, but couldn't be any more relevant um, and couldn't be any more pertinent um, to all of our lives um, at this moment. Um, you'll know that uh, the, the title of our conversation this evening is looking out for all of our mental health in the wake of a pandemic. And so um, I will focus my remarks on some of the particular circumstances and challenges that we are all collectively facing, um, perhaps in different ways, um, as a result of the events that have occurred since, since last March. But I thought by way of introduction, um, firstly, I would, I would say that uh, during the course of this conversation, there'll be people that come to this that have come to this conversation for lots of different reasons um it may be out of interest you might never have been to a, a talk of this nature before and um this might be your first engagement in any sort of public conversation about mental health and um, you may have been supporting someone who has really suffered with a mental health perhaps a, a friend or close family member maybe you yourself um have experienced some challenges and difficulties and particularly um, in the wake of the pandemic. And, and so I start by saying that we um, engage in this conversation in a really kind and positive spirit. Um, and I should start by, um, by way of disclaimer that I'm, I'm not a medical professional, um, but I do have extensive experience in this space and have done um, since 2013. Um, I have undergone the training from uh, mental, health first, uh, mental health first day training, so I'm a mental health first aider. Um, and have engaged in lots of different other bits and pieces of training as well. So I certainly know more than most, but I, I, it's very important I, I share with you from the start that you know I'm not a, a doctor or a, a clinical professional or a, um, a therapist, um, but certainly you know, I'm really keen to engage in this discussion. And certainly what I will point to is where people might like to go to should they require um, or want to find out more or get additional support. And I'll say it at the start and I'll say it at the end, but um, we focused this, um, this event around the work that Jamie does and Jamie does such an incredible job within the Jewish community of providing culturally and religiously sensitive and appropriate services, mental health services to predominantly people over the age of 16. And although increasingly they're just starting to support younger people. Um, I previously lived in Golders Green and they've got, when times allow, an incredible um, resource with the cafe that they have um, in Golders Green um, and they are involved as I'm involved um, in the mental health initiative across um, Jewish schools. They play such an important role and certainly um, I would point to Jamie as a great place to access information, advice and services um, should you or a family member or friend require it. And the other kind of great one-stop shop is from the charity Mind. And um, there's many mental health charities, um, but mine certainly is the kind of catch-all one-stop shop that um, I would say from the start of somewhere to go for further information. And Young Minds um, is another resource and fantastic charity that do um, great work um, supporting young people and um, either their parents or carers and have a dedicated hot hotline as well. So I say that from the start, just to um, so if people know where to turn to for extra information. And um, you know, people often ask me, you know, why, why am I so passionate about mental health um, and certainly um, I'd perhaps just touch on my own personal experience and engagement with it um, my political experience and engagement with it and what I do um, by way of um, seeking to kind of continue to make a difference since I've left parliament. So my, my personal experience is that I grew up um, having a very very close family member um, in inpatient care uh, inpatient mental health care and at various points during my childhood we would um, go as a family to visit this close family member. I'm not going to disclose who that close family member is because it's not my story to tell and it's not my experience um, but certainly um, was the case you know growing up in I'm, I'm, a, I'm approaching my 40th year um, but uh, certainly growing up it was something that we never discussed beyond the family it was very much something that we didn't disclose or talk about kind of beyond the confines of the family um, and it, that isn't particular to my family um, certainly you know, we are still contending when it comes um, to discussing the issues of mental health we are still tackling a sort of taboo and um, there is still discrimination that exists there are certainly countless surveys that show 
that we are still on a journey when it comes to being open and discussing mental health in the same way that we are open to engage and discuss our physical health. Um, and that then translates into how people are able to access services. So uh, you go to accident and emergency with a broken bone, you expect it to be fixed. But people who might be at any moment in the journey act, trying to access or um, in the process of accessing mental health services, the expectations of how well that service will deliver is much lower. And certainly the current expectation within our NHS of how many people who need it should be able to access help isn't 100%. Uh, and certainly my political campaigning has taken me to really strive to have that, what we call parity of esteem for mental health. What does that mean? Parity of esteem means equality of access, that we should treat access to mental health services in the same way that we do physical health services. So we had the combination and the challenge of, you know, still, um, ex you know, still experiences within families where people don't want to be talking about it. We have many surveys in the workplace that show that people don't feel confident speaking or comfortable speaking to their managers about why they might be taking time off. They might, um, you know, say that it's because of a physical health condition when in fact it's because of mental health reasons that people are less likely to come forward and to speak to their GPs about um, their experience. And sometimes when they do that, they have to go numerous times before they then actually um, um, re receive from their GPs the um, appropriate referrals. They then have to wait extraordinary amounts of times too often to actually access the service, have initial assessment. And then the time between the first assessment and treatment is also still too long. We also know, and um, particularly in, um, um, over the course of this year, that people have struggled to access inpatient services when they have required them as well. So there's, there's, there's challenges with how society approaches this, although it's really important to, to, to kind of reinforce the fact that there have been great societal changes and cultural changes and a really important campaign that was set up um, around, forgive me, around 2005, the Time to Talk campaign. Um, which still does really important work has, has kind of really led the way to change our, na our national conversation about mental health and if I reflect on my time in parliament between 2013 and 2020 when I was really focused on these issues and um, certainly kind of the journey that the political journey was um, you know very very significant that we would speak about it and engage in it and so many more MPs towards the end of my um, term and time in parliament would be open and discussing it in a way that wasn't the case when I first started immersing myself um, in these issues back in 2013. So I had my, my family experience um, uh, and you know, very sadly I have lost a number of people known to me um, through suicide um, and very very sadly um, you know, I've, I've lost four people that I have known um, to suicide um, they've all been men uh, and they've been men in their 30s, 40s and 50s. Um, and that is also kind of a, an additional taboo when it comes to discussing mental health. Um, uh, it's, it's very, 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 very difficult. It's very particularly challenging within a religious context as well. Um, and that's you know, still something that I think we are working through um, as a community. So that in particular has kind of really focused my attention because you know, ultimately we should be doing everything possible to support people. So they don't get to the moment at which they that they have feel that there's no other option um than to take their lives and um certainly we know uh, regrettably that you know there are moments at which that 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 terrible terrible event is more likely to happen and um certainly we know of occasions where if someone's taken their life then the people immediately close to them that's you know they are most at risk in in the year following um a suicide um and likewise, we know that people that are in inpatient mental health services at the time immediately after the um, um, after the time that they um, are able to leave inpatient services is also a particularly vulnerable moment as well. So um, that in particular is something that I could have been, you know, been very, very alive to. And it always struck me um, when I was a, an MP for just, just close to 10 years that um, because of the, all the mental health campaigning that I did, I'd often have, it was particularly men um, um, uh, that would come to my surgery, um, men particularly over the age of 40, that would want to talk about mental health, would be open in discussing with me their experiences and perhaps their challenges with accessing services, but would then get on to talk about the fact that, you know, they were happy to talk to me because they knew that 
Um, I was someone that um, accepted mental health, that you know, thought it was important, but they hadn't been able for one reason or another to talk about it either with their parents or with their siblings. And I heard that story you know, on, on very many occasions. It wasn't, it wasn't a one or you know, two off, it was something that kind of happened repeatedly. So for all those reasons, um, it's very much kind of been for me a passion to, to speak out about it, to have those conversations, and also to ensure that, um, that we do everything possible as a country to put mental health on an equal footing to our physical health services. And in, actually, you know, I was part of the campaign that had enshrined into law um, the term parity of esteem for mental health. Um, worked with my colleagues in the House of Lords and got that into the Health and Social Care Act, which came in back in 2012. Well, we're like nearly nine years down the line and we're still quite a far distance from achieving that real equality for mental health. So until that happens, um, my campaigning will continue. And when I was in Parliament, it's just worth sharing with you that I, um, again, got to focus on this issue predominantly when I was appointed as the Shadow Minister for Public Health back in 2014, and I had mental health within my brief at that time. Um, I then, in 2015, was appointed as uh, the first ever Shadow Cabinet member for mental health. Uh, and in that role, all I did was focus on issues to do with mental health. And I had the, the real uh, privilege of getting to travel right across the United Kingdom to visit lots of different services and lots of different people who are either campaigning or working in this space, with lots of different groups and um, ages. Um, uh, and that was fantastic. And then I left the front bench and I imagine there might be some political questions possibly later on. Um, uh, I left the front bench for, you know, I was very, very passionate about everything I did in that space, but I couldn't do it uh, without ignoring everything else that was going on around me. Um, in the wake of the referendum result in 2016, I left the shadow cabinet. Uh, I then served on the health and social care select committee for four years. And during that time, I um, was the committee expert on mental health. And um, I had the privilege of presenting to Parliament the Joint Health and Education Select Committee's report into young people's mental health uh, and took questions in Parliament. Um, normally that, that role is reserved for chairs, but it was, again, a reflection of all the work that I had been involved in and my expertise that meant that I responded to those questions at that time in Parliament. Um, and since, since, since leaving, um, since um, not being returned um, at the end of 2019, I... I've still continued um, to be very much engaged and involved. Um, so I was, um, as some of these roles and responsibilities um, I had been appointed to when I was still an MP and I've continued since. So I sit on the Money and Mental Health Policy Institute. This is a charity um, that is funded by Martin Lewis with the proceeds of um, his sale of moneysavingexpert.com. And that looks very specifically at the intersection and interconnectivity between financial distress, um, being in debt uh, and poor mental health and the two interconnect and um, correlate with each other. Um, I um, am a vice president of the British Association of Counselors and Psychotherapists. Uh, and I um, also, um, as of just a few months ago, was appointed as the chair of the Maternal Mental Health Alliance. And the Maternal Mental Health Alliance is a charity funded by National Lottery and Comic Relief. And um, it has, um, I think we've just reached our, our 100th member. And we are an alliance that brings together many different charities and royal colleges and um, grassroots voluntary and community services that support uh, women in the antenatal um, and the perinatal, mental, uh, perinatal period, so the year that follows birth. Um, people may not be aware that um, as a woman, you are 30 to 40 times more likely to experience a period of psychosis in the year following birth um, than any other time in your life. Not, not, not many people know that. Um, and so um, as a campaign, the Alliance is bringing together lots of different organizations that I have grassroots experience um, in, in specific areas of royal colleges of um, either pediatrics and child health of psychiatrists um, who have the clinical professionals working in this field supporting um, expectant or new mums and their babies and people that work in something called a mother and baby unit so you might never have heard of a mother and baby unit they are really really important places for new mums to go to that might be experiencing um, uh, experiencing severe um, mental ill health and um, to make sure that during that period they are kept together with their babies um, we don't have enough of them in this country um, um, we don't have any of them in Northern Ireland or Wales 
and we just um, got one agreed in Scotland. Um, so one of the pieces of work that we do is to try and ensure that we've got uh, those across the country and we're trying to tell, turn the whole of the UK green um, to ensure that there's at least specialist mental health services for specific for, for new mums um, because it's so important to support both mum and baby during that period. We know that it can have a, a really significant impact on a child's life if um, if um, mum doesn't um, receive the support that they need at that time. So that's my charity responsibility and then only today I've spent some time with our Northern Ireland team and um, also with our group of um, uh, mums who have lived experience um, themselves, who have um, either had um, bouts of um, maternal um, anxiety or um, um, perinatal depression uh, or um, postpartum psychosis, various different conditions you might never have heard of, um, but are kind of very isolating, very challenging. Um, and so we ensure that as a, an alliance that we are listening first and foremost to people who have that lived experience to ensure that the work that we do um, speaks to um, their experiences and, and what um, needs to change. Um, there is certainly some other things, but I've actually forgotten them. And by way of my day job, so um, I'm now the managing director of advocacy and public affairs at Edelman UK. Um, Edelman is um, uh, was described by PR Week as um, U the UK's agency of the decade. Um, I lead on everything to do with our campaigning um, and our advocacy. And within the business, I'm one of the leads on mental health. So we are a business of 600 people. Um, and I, I do a lot of work to ensure that we are supporting the mental health of our employees um, as well, particularly at this time. So that's a kind of a very long introduction, but perhaps touching all these different things because that might prompt you to um, think about some questions um, when we get to that moment. Um, um, I've, co you know, I've, I've covered and have experience of lots of different sectors. I should also add as a, as a vice um, president of the Jewish Leadership Council, I'm also, as I mentioned, the project that Jamie is involved in, I'm uh, working on the partnership to support mental health in Jewish schools um, as well. Um, so I do that in my, in my free time. Um, uh, and so the, the focus of the conversation this evening is about our mental health in the wake of a pandemic. Um, and I kind of touched on how you know, mental health has already been treated differently, but also how we are experiencing our mental health. And you only have to look at the headlines, uh, unfortunately, just of the, the past, I think it's week to 10 days alone to see just some of the studies that have come out that have kind of really shone a spotlight on how we're all experiencing our lives um, at this time. And um, there's some there's some studies that have come out from I mentioned Mind the mental health charity. Um, there's also been a, a really important study that was conducted by the Princess Trust that's just come out in the past week. The Lancet had done a study of um, how we're accessing services, and it's fair to say, as a, as a as a country, and it's unsurprising we are all experiencing tough times. And there's been an increase in people um, experiencing challenges and difficulties and and wanting to access services. So Mind have said that, um, uh, so it's uh, Paul Farmer, who is the chief executive of Paul of, of Mind, um, has, has, has said that we are also in the midst of a mental health pandemic. Um, and that's off the back of you know, their experience of seeing views of their website uh, go up by more than 50% a day. Um, interesting, Jeremy Hunt, the former Secretary of State for Health, now the chair of the Health and Social Care um, select committee um, has talked about the impact that isolation is having on people at this time and particularly as we find ourselves in the midst of a third lockdown I'm very concerned that um, this third lockdown could be a tipping point um, at leading to what he described as an, an epidemic of mental uh, illness um, I previously just uh, referred to um, young minds um, they have said how um, through their studies and their experience of collecting all the data from um, since last March, they've seen a massive increase in parents contacting their hotline because of the experience of their children and teenagers uh, experiencing ex increased levels of anxiety at this time, increased uh, episodes of loneliness. Uh, and this is, again, there's no surprise that we would all be having a tough time. Um, for many of us, we are not able to um, use our, our normal coping techniques, things that we would normally do to kind of alleviate our, our levels of anxiety and stress and strain and, um, um, and, and also contend specifically with the issue of loneliness. So, you know, for anyone that would normally find themselves going to the gym or um, going to actually see friends and family, you know, we can't all join together around the shovel's table on a Friday night. 
we can't do our sports, we can't do our yoga. We're also struggling to access a GP as well, um, because first and foremost, you know, the GPs are contending with um, physical health related um, conditions, administering um, uh, the vaccination, etc. Um, and the Prince's Trust are the that I pointed to. They they do an annual youth index. So their youth index has just come out um, for um, 2021, uh, and 47% of young people are saying that their mental health has worsened over the course of the past year. And for young people that are not in education, employment, or training, um, people are saying that they are unable to cope at this time. And what's impacting on that also is the economic situation that our country's faced and um, is expecting to face, and particularly for young people that um, are very concerned about where their future opportunities might come from. Um, that is a particular point of tension where 62% have said that it's um, that they're finding um, it very difficult to manage at this time because they think it's going to be impossible for them to find a job. So we, you know, we find ourselves in the midst of so many different challenges because um, if we look at the entire life cycle, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll go through it all. Um, I'm a mum to a one and three year old. Um, my one and three year old are in nursery at this time, but they weren't able to go to nursery during the first lockdown for the 12 weeks. Um, they're not able to do extracurricular activities. They're not able to um, do their socialization in the same way they would do normally because we can't do play dates and they can't go to um, their singing group. Um, obviously they are in nursery, but for those children that aren't in nursery, it's you know, even more challenging. And it's great that we can currently go to the park, but there's moments at which we haven't been able to do even that. We know for school children who, you know, and teenagers in particular, for whom socialising is so important, and there was already concerns about um, people kind of not having that one-to-one -one engagement and doing uh, kind of leaning too much on um, engaging via a screen. That that's been particularly challenging. I know many parents um, of either primary or secondary um, age children that um, whose children are having you know, a particularly difficult time, particularly at transition points as well. So um, you know, I can think of a mum whose son's you know started secondary school in this year, and uh, you know it's just finding it so difficult to cope and manage at this time. You know, left behind you know a great support structure that, that he was aware of you know that he that he knew too well and you know starting secondary school at this time is just you know close to um impossible um and then people that you know are expecting to do exams have studied for exams can't do exams and um, uh you know and that might not be um you know that might be better at exams and then won't be um assessed in the same way or might not get the grades that they thought or would have done should they have had that opportunity so many different issues Young people that are supposed to be going to university, perhaps started university, had like you know, the worst freshers experience. As I have a friend who, as a parent, you know, said, this is, "You know, this, you're working towards getting to university, and it's going to be so great, and it's all about freshers and having that first year experience." You know, you've, you've built this up all this time, and then it comes to it, and who knew? Who could ever have um, foreseen the fact that you know that that first year university experience that's you know so critical wouldn't go ahead and um, young people that didn't get to have the tour experience going to Israel you know for me that was so formative so many friends that I'm still in contact with today um, and didn't have that opportunity either and um, coming out of university the lack of um, or the reduced amount of opportunities um, people in working life who um, for, you know either um, found themselves without a job um, you know at all levels and we know that people have um, seen reductions in their workplaces um, certainly in, in my workplace, we had um, a reduction of 7% of our workforce um, in the wake of the pandemic because there was reduced demand for our services and that's incredibly difficult. And then also having to contend with this new WFH, working from home. You know, are we working from home or are we living at work? Um, and certainly if I reflect on my past year, there have been moments when uh, it's extraordinary moments where you know or, or days where I've been literally glued to a screen from eight o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock at night um, and gone days on end without doing as much doing more than just dropping my kids and picking them up from nursery um, and not actually kind of getting any physical activity you know normally my walk to the off my walk and journey to the office and back would be at least you know a few thousand steps and instead I'm kind of glued to that screen and then you know people are perhaps at the later stages in their lives not able to see their grandparents not able to see their family and friends um, you know, being you know even more lonely than they perhaps would have been otherwise because they're not able to engage perhaps um in because of the digital divides you're not as comfortable with using the technology or don't have access to the technology that's also been a massive issue for children from families that don't have access to the internet 
um, you know, all of these issues, um, new mums and dads, new mums in particular, having to have the scan by themselves, having to do early stages of labour by themselves, um, only having their partners and husbands with them, uh, um, you know, in, in, the, in the moments immediately after the birth and then not with them uh, for much longer. A friend of mine just gave birth last, last week and her husband um, was only allowed to pop in for half an hour because of COVID. So, um, and, and then for new parents, not having the support structures that, you know, are so critical and crucial to supporting what is a, you know, a very challenging time in someone's life. Um, and people having relationship breakdown as well because they find themselves in circumstances they never expected. We know that we're seeing um, increased levels of domestic abuse at this time. So um, that is the, just kind of like a counter through what is um, additional challenges that are being presented because of the pandemic. But certainly um, for, as a positive, we're seeing so many things that are bringing joy and where people have you know, brought um, kindness and uh, Thought to kind of extend a hand and be supportive. And um, um, so I, I signed up um, at the start of the pandemic to be an NHS responder. Uh, and through that, have been involved in the check in and chat. Um, and certainly, um, I think at the last count, there's 800,000 people who had volunteered um, and who, right across the country, are checking in and chatting. Um, with people um, that might be suffering at this time, particularly um, with their mental health. And we, you know, we can point to lots of things where you know, the, it's the heroes, the unsung heroes that have kept our supermarkets going and done our deliveries. And um, um, you know, people have been on the front line that have made such a difference that have um, um, kind of sought to kind of strike some sort of balance and, and to counter what has been otherwise very, very challenging times. Um, I know that I have got a lot of you know, kind of it's made me feel a bit better to know that I was making a contribution. I've done the um, um, pickups and deliveries of um, medication from pharmacies for people that have been shielding. And, um, and so, you know, there's lots of different experiences of where people um, are seeking to make a difference and that has helped them to offset what are otherwise very, very challenging times. Um, great numbers of people at this time who are undergoing the training to administer uh, the vaccinations, which is kind of the light at the end of the tunnel, which is going to see us through. So, um, I suppose I've kind of reflected on a multitude of different areas that are meaning that all of us collectively are having a really tough time. Um, and having a tough time doesn't necessarily mean that we will suffer with our mental health, but certainly when you're not able to cope with a tough time for very good reasons because of things that we'd normally do to cope are not available to us anymore, it's no surprise that people then are going on to suffer um, in, in medical ways in terms of increased levels of anxiety or depression uh, and or um, other uh, mental health conditions. So um, I suppose we, what's critical in all this is that for anyone that is, and I should have said, you know, one in four of us at any given time will suffer with our mental health. There used to be a stat saying one of us in our, um, in our lifetime. It's not. It's one of us, one in four of us on this call. So I think I saw 100 people on this call. So 25 of us on this call um, will be suffering at this time. That is that is now the kind of, the, that is the, the agreed um, and accepted statistic. I count myself very fortunate that to date, um, I have been pretty resilient and had quite a few things thrown at me um, and have come out the other side. But I'm very, very aware um, and very, very sensitive to the fragility of the human condition. Um, and I've seen that kind of firsthand from lots of people, whether it's the the high-flying Bank of England economist who I met in a mother and baby unit who was experiencing postpartum psychosis, to the 53-year-old high-flying civil servant, top of his game, who from nowhere suddenly experienced a, a very severe uh, um, nervous breakdown, which then meant he had to be medically um, retired from work. And um, you know, it can hit. You know, it doesn't discriminate according to. You know, what, what your abilities may be for your economic circumstances and um, what education you had it could affect any of us at any given time and so for that reason you know I'm very very you know uh, aware on a personal level that you know tomorrow it could be me uh, and so um, I, I know that I, I've equipped myself with the information to know where to go and that I, I wouldn't hold back in coming forward to accessing support because we know that the quicker that people access support, the better it is for their recovery. Um, but equally, I want to, as I said at the start, um, there's still a campaigning job to be done to ensure that when people come forward, they are able um, to access the services they need. So that is the challenge that um, still um, is ahead of us. I'm probably going to pause my comments there, Rabbi, because I'm just in the time and I could probably talk for 
uh, as much time again, but I, I, you know, I'm sure that this um, opening remarks um, will hopefully have prompted some thoughts and um, uh, contributions and be great to kind of answer or respond to any questions people have. Well, well, first of all, I just wanted to to comment based upon um, your, your your presentation, uh, the fact that you were able to join us this evening, and um, with with everything that you are um, continuing to be involved with, uh, just thank you once again for uh, for taking the time, but also um, for um, uh, for championing mental health in in in, in this country, and really. Um, you know, chazak, chazak, keep up the, the great work that you're doing. It's, it's so appreciated and so valued. Uh, but this is an opportunity, as you said, for people to um, to ask questions towards you. Um, the the easiest way to to uh, to ask questions would be to use the chat function. And either if you're happy for to send the, the questions for for everyone to be able to see, but equally anyone who wants to send the questions just to me, so you are remaining anonymous in your questions, that's, that'll be absolutely fine as well. The chat function is a really great tool to be able to do that. Um, and we'll probably deal with the questions in some type of group format. If you're not comfortable using the, the chat function, um, you can also virtually raise your hand as well, which is something that you can do by um, going on to um, the to the, the participants and you, you'll have an opportunity to do that as well. Um, if you can't do that either, um, we will um, use the, um, we, we also have the function of simply calling out and doing it the old chaotic way as well. So let's try to get in that order if possible. Um, and, and, and please, if you could post your questions, we do have some time now um, and Luciana is here, which is fantastic. So please avail yourselves of the, um, of the opportunity as well um, in order to do so. So um, we're going to actually start open up um, with, uh, with Nikki, if you wouldn't mind um, to unmute yourself to be able to ask a question at this time. Thank you, Rabbi. And thank you very much, Luciana. It was really fascinating to, to hear um, you talking about mental health in, in, in such a, um, a rounded way and 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 uh, thank you for everything that you do. Um, I was really um, heartened to hear you, about you talking about your experiences of volunteering during the pandemic and making a difference. It's my day job, um, and um, we talk about men uh, positive mental health through volunteering a lot. So I'm curious to know from your perspective how how do we encourage people who are struggling with their mental health to be able to see the value of giving to others or volunteering. I'm not talking about people with serious mental health issues, but but people who are struggling and and can't actually get over the line in terms of being able to think that they have something to give to others. What what would be the encouragement that we could give them to do that? Okay. Nikki, thank you very much for that question. Um, we're going to also now turn to uh, to Mike. I believe that you said that you have a question as well that you would like to ask. Uh, Mike Siegel, if you want to unmute yourself, please. Hi, Luciana. Good to uh, virtually see you again. Um, my question is this. Um, in the media, the focus is almost entirely on the physical. We're told all the time this is the number of cases this is the number of admissions, this is the number of deaths. But when you look for information about the mental side of things, there's actually very little indeed. So why do you think this is? And what can we do to redress the balance? Okay, thank you very much, Mike, for um, also the question about the invisibility of the, of, the, of the crisis for mental health as well. We're going to put in one more question now, um, if we can. So um, the final question is, uh, coming from from Jillian, so Jillian wants to know: is it is it possible um, is it possible to ask um, to deal with bereavement scenarios um, during this period of time, um, and how best to cope with them, especially having to live on your own after you've gone through it when you're more isolated? So those are the three that maybe we could throw out from the beginning. Well, thank you for those um, such interesting questions, and obviously spanning you know, such different areas, um, and. Uh, forgive me Gillian that I didn't mention bereavement but it was actually in my notes but I was conscious of the time but you no know, such a such a difficult area and, and and one that has been um so impacted by by, by these events 
Um, if I kind of take them in turn, I mean, Nikki, your point about volunteering, I kind of touched on it without going into too much detail, but certainly we know that there's, you know, there's lots of um, studies that show the value that volunteering brings, not only obviously to people um, that are on the receiving end of that volunteering, whatever that may be, helping in a food bank, um, bringing people, um, as I mentioned, medicines or checking in and chatting, um, uh, because there's a raft of different things that, that, that people can be doing at this time. Um, but there's also the value to those people that themselves volunteer. Uh, and I think, you know, we all collectively, you know, I know about it, and there's certainly many studies that show the evidence of, you know, why that's important. And certainly it was a motivating factor for me, um, first and foremost, because, you know, I suppose that kind of public service is an inherent in, in who I am and, and what I've done. And I mean, I wanted to make a contribution um, at the start of the pandemic, but but also from a selfish perspective, I knew that it was something that it was going to give me um, focus and it was going to kind of um, give me external perspective. Um, and, and I say that as a mum who did have a one and three year old at home and um, full time, um, uh, a husband who was uh, at home, but very, very busy trying to, you know, stabilize his business at, at a very, very challenging time. I was, it was just before I started my new role. So, um, you know, I, I'd never done full-time childcare and full-time nursery care and kind of contending with that challenge, which I thought was gonna be a walk in the park and um, it turned out it wasn't. Um, but certainly, you know, it was important, it was important to me to give me something to focus on that was not myself and my, you know, that took me beyond my own experience. So again, um, I think always, you know, there's so much value that comes from volunteering uh, that, um, and, and it was great to see, um, actually, I think it was elevated at the start of the pandemic by way of the fact that we had schemes, for example, like the NHS responders and that there was some work done to kind of publicize the volume of signups and how many people got involved. I would like to see more of it. I think, you know, and again, it's incumbent on all of us. Like I, I include myself in that responsibility to, to talk more about um, the work that I still continue to do on a voluntary basis. Um, Again, because um, uh, you know, sharing sharing the load is great, and the more people, the better. But also, so people can understand that it can it really brings value. Um, and obviously, we learn about it. Um, you know, for me, it's important in, in kind of in kind of very much um, in, in terms of my Jewish values. You know, tikkun olam about kind of repairing our world, repairing our communities, make a difference in our communities, and that community means different things to different people. Um, but yes, we just need to talk about it more. And um, uh, yeah, I think I think that kind of just the the, the the voluntary and like the charitable sector, I think, is you know, because it's dealing with the immediacy of the challenges that you know are presented because they're you know the, um, so many charities at this time are really struggling because they've seen their funding reduced because local authorities have seen their funding reduced. You know, there was a bit of a nod to charities by way of the kind of chance of bringing forward some extra monies, but. Um, you know, we've also seen such massive increases in levels of need that you know, it's really difficult for charities and voluntary sector organisations to equally kind of be making the case. You know, it's just a kind of case of everyone's trying to survive at this moment. But certainly, I think, and, and this also kind of speaks to Mike's question, I think there will be an opportunity to do more to celebrate the contribution of volunteers. I, I, I was... I thought it was really, it was quite moving. Anyone that, you know, I quite like the Queen's speech every year. Um, it was quite, quite moving that there was, you know, um, you know some acknowledgement of the of the contribution that, that volunteers have made in, in that but certainly I think you know it requires a national effort um, and again speaking to Mike's question about what can we do to kind of address the imbalance I mean this is this is the perennial problem when you are contending with preservation of life the immediate kind of um, priority of preservation of life particularly when you know we meet today and we're having this conversation in the wake of like the most devastating statistics of how many people have passed away in the past 24 hours uh you know the, the largest figure on record over 1800 so you know when, when kind of minds are focused because people are losing their lives um you know sadly um i say it's no surprise that mental health then gets relegated ha however i know that there are so many whether it's um government uh, departments or local authorities and or um, other organizations that you know the, the, the kind of the um, impact is going to be so far-reaching um, and wide you know after um, you know once we've all had our vaccinations um, and the kind of the mental health impacts are going to be right at the top of the list so the Lancet survey that um, study that came out in the past week I think is really important and certainly it's always been the case in mental health that 
different sectors within uh, mental health or under the mental health umbrella have had to do more to kind of prove what's going on. So um, within the Ma Maternal Mental Health Alliance of, of which I chair, we have um, a study, a very extensive study that has been um, carried out by the Centre for Mental Health and um, that will um, in the coming um, month and will report on what the impact has been for expectant and new mums and, and pointing to hard evidence um, as well. We've also got another study that's um, going to be uh, is in the process of being conducted by the London School of Economics. So there will be studies that will kind of add to the weight of evidence. Um, and so I think that imbalance will be imbalance, it will be addressed. Um, but it won't, you know, it, it will take at least six months, I think, before the, you know, the, imp the mental health impacts are, are really first of all like discussed I think we do I think, I think we hear about them in the press but then also addressed um and I wish it wasn't this way but and certainly you know the government has put more money into mental health services to the um, I think it's um forgive me I forget the exact figure but you know it, it's 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 some, some billion pounds um but that certainly isn't going to be enough so and again it will be the responsibility of anyone that's concerned about this or has a passion for it to ensure that it receives the attention um, and the resource that it deserves. Um, Gillian, your point about people have, that have experienced bereavement um, is really, really important. Um, and again, I, I just, I note, um, I, I think it was yesterday or the day before, um, the experience within the Jewish community has been um, even more distressing than for the wider population um, for, for our number in terms of how many people um, that have sadly um, lost their lives because of COVID. Um, and obviously we haven't been able to grieve uh, and mourn in the same way that we normally would um, sit shiver in the same way that we would and um, have our lavoyas in the same way that we would. And that has made it uh, all the more harder. Um, certainly um, I know that uh, those organizations and professionals that um, provide bereavement counseling have already seen an increase um, in um, the requirement um, for, for those services and that, and that support. And um, certainly bereavement counselling is, is really, really important for anyone that needs it. So there will be a job to uh, be done to ensure people kind of access that support, even if it is by way of a screen. Um, again, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's all of our responsibility to think about anyone that might have lost someone at this time to do all we can to compensate for the for the circumstances that we find ourselves in and whether you know that's dropping off meals or picking up the phone it's not the same as holding someone's hand and giving them a hug but um you know, it can go some way to just making sure people feel that you know that they are supported um it's not easy and there isn't a perfect answer and it's one of the i think one of the most difficult and challenging elements of all of this that is the kind of personal devastation of of losing someone and 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 not being able to be supported as we all would have liked you know um, and just can't at this time. So I'm sorry that I had to have a perfect answer. Unfortunately, there aren't perfect answers. Um, it is so difficult. Uh, I'm going to group together three of um, three separate questions. So Susie um, wanted to know about um, a, a specific grouping of the frontline workers, whether they're the doctors or others who have just been um, nurses, who have just been under um, so much pressure and seen so, so many things. Um, so many challenges, um, you know, support for them. Uh, another area of, of, of Karen wanted to know about was um, people who have um, gone through miscarriages, uh, not just during the pandemic, but um, just generally, um, and the mental health um, challenges around that that, are, that aren't addressed as much. Um, and Richard wanted to know about, um, about those who go through separations and divorce um, during this time and, and, and increased isolation. So that's one group of, um, of, of areas that are, are particularly sensitive and, and, and need a specific mental health um, uh, attention. Um, another question, group of questions has to do with you and politics and basically um, the question around, um, because you're, you're such an amazing campaigner, and you um and and you and, and what you do is so important. Have you have you thought about your future with politics and um, playing a role, whether it's in the Labour Party um, or otherwise? So that's two different areas of questioning. And I'll I'll start with the with the first group first, and and certainly thank you to Susie, Karen, and Richard for kind of pointing to areas that I didn't touch on 
but are so you know equally important as well we know that there's many different sectors of people that are continuing to work and are on the front line so they're not working from home but um you know quite the opposite they are they, they are on the front line you know contending with this uh, and uh, certainly when it comes to doctors and nurses and ancillary staff you know um, you only have to look at some of the documentaries that have been on bbc if you get a chance to um or perhaps you might follow the um the social media feeds of um uh people like dr rosena who's a and then people also working on the front line um my former um room um office uh, mate uh dr paul williams who's a former mp who i um, just got uh, an OBE for his services who's kind of worked in an incredible amount of shifts um, to make a difference on the front line um, in the northeast. Um, uh, he's a former um, uh, reality TV star on, on Love Island but Dr Alex I think who's done a really important job on his Instagram feed of just kind of sharing with people like you know how devastating and difficult it is and again that, that this experience is, is even worse um, in this second or third wave, depending on, on where you live in the country, um, where, where there's just so many people being admitted in, in these in, at this time and so many people very, very sadly losing their lives. And um, certainly there is a really important service that is that was initiated and set up actually a few years ago by Dr. Claire Gerarda, who um, was the former chair of the Royal College of GPs, which was a specific mental health support um, um, more than support service but like proper mental health and um, services for um any clinicians um and i just i'm just so grateful on behalf of doctors and, and nurses that that service was created before the pandemic so um you know there has been a, a, quite a significant resource gone into that service to ramp it up to make sure that um doctors and nurses can can access you know specific support that's tailored and is appropriate uh, and and, and can flex, you know, kind of around the schedules, which is often quite difficult of, of doctors and nurses, because we know that um, doctors and nurses are experiencing extreme burnout um, and just the trauma from what they've had to experience and the difficult decisions they are having to make, um, sadly, again, as we speak, because um, there just isn't enough capacity in some of our hospitals. So but very, very serious. And, and it's a really important issue. Um, I'm glad at least we've got something to make, make some difference. Um, but again, there is a job to be done um, when this is all over to ensure that um, um, doctors and nurses, uh, anyone working in the NHS is, is, is properly supported. There is talk of um, giving doctors and nurses some extra time off um, uh, to kind of pay leave. Uh, and um, I'm sure that the BMA and other representative organisations will um, continue to ensure that their members are represented and, and, and that their um, contribution is raised because it's all very well us standing outside our homes and clapping for them at eight o'clock but that clapping needs to be matched um, with actual support and um, yeah there's a lot to be done there. Um, Karen your really important um, contribution about miscarriage and, um, and again I, I touched on the challenge of mums having to go for scans um, yeah, and we know that there's mums or expected mums having that have gone for scans and have ha gone in for a scan by themselves and received devastating and tragic news and have had to do that by themselves and you know my heart goes out to anyone that has had that terrible terrible experience um we have in in this country baby loss awareness week and we have you know, a number of different charities including um sands and the miscarriage association and i know that they've um, being funded to provide additional support and advice at this time and um, perhaps we can ensure that those kind of details are circulated so people can access that very specific support that is tailored and uh, is appropriate for um, women experiencing this at this time but yeah it, it's made all the more worse for the fact that people have had to receive that news by themselves. Richard um I touched on the challenges of relationships um, and people finding themselves having um, in the first wave um, spent um, times with their partners that they wouldn't have normally done otherwise. And, um, and, and sadly, in some instances, we've seen um, that, you know, it translate into increased levels of uh, domestic abuse, domestic violence. Um, that's at the kind of the, the, the most awful end. But yes, people, um, not again not able to have space in their partners and um 
having very, very difficult times. So uh, Relate have had, um, which is a charity that um, provides um, support for uh, people in relationships, have seen a massive increase in um, demand and requirement for their services, and they are certainly available to contend with that. Um, certainly when it comes to parents being separated from their children because they haven't been able to access things like, um, forgive me, I forget the, the exact term, but they're, um, 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 supported visits and with their children. Again, there's also different things that people might not know about, but having kind of really significant impacts on people's lives. And we've got some difficult months ahead because it's not going to alleviate, you know, I don't, well, I say I don't think it's definitely not going to alleviate until the end of March. So again, for anyone that might be experiencing any of those particular um, um, experiences, um, someone that's experienced loss, someone that's um, having a very difficult relationship or having relationship breakdown or going through divorce. Um, again, it's in terms of the kindness we need to consider and extend to friends and family. Um, that's a job that we can all do to just try and make things a little bit better, but um, there isn't a magic wand at this time. Um, Rabbi, the question about um, politics, was it one question or was it, so the question was, am I going to go back? Um, well, well, kind of because of, uh, of how important the work that you're doing and how, how valuable you are um, at, it, outside politics, but also inside. Uh, yeah, so, and, and, and it also the question touched upon um, specifically the, with, the, with the labor movement and, and, and going back towards there or any opinions on them championing without you um, mental health with the, with the new leadership. So kind of all bunched together. <laughs> I don't even start with that. Um, so, um, uh, I don't even know where to begin. Um, what my we find ourselves like you know, you know I'm I'm still uh, I think uh, processing and coming out of coming out of politics and you, know, you can't replicate being an MP uh, anywhere else. Uh, you can replicate elements of the roles and the responsibilities, but you can't you know you can't do it all. Um, in the job, you know, you're either in parliament, or you're not in parliament. Um, and so, you know, I'm seeking to ensure that the expertise that I built up and particularly my passion for mental health, I'm able to continue making a difference. And certainly people can make a difference. Uh, again, when, you know, come back to, to, the, to, the, to the values around Tikkun Olam, people can make a difference in all different ways. It could be in your immediate family, it could be in your street, it can be within your senior community. It can be as a councillor in your ward. Um, it can be within a school as a school governor on a policing panel. It could be nationally as an MP. You know, there's lots of different ways to make a difference and make a contribution. And certainly at the very least, I'm trying to continue making a contribution and making a difference campaigning by the, the responsibilities that I've continued with all that I've um, that I've taken up um, since leaving Parliament. So um, I'm, I'm happy, you know, I'm happy, I say it's happy the right word, you know, I'm, I'm content that I'm able to still make a difference in that regard and I still have a voice and I still have a platform even though it's slightly different and it's not um, as a member of parliament. There's a separate question about, you know, what I might choose to do um, in what we expect would be like four years time when there might be a, you know, a future general election and separately what I think and feel about the political party that had been my home for almost 20 years and that um, I took the very, very difficult decision to leave um, back in, um, uh, I should remember now, um, uh, February of 2019. Um, and I think, you know, just, just to kind of respond to that, you know, the Labour Party is on a journey. Uh, I mean, certainly, um, you know, I work on the fact that Jeremy Corbyn and uh, his, the people around him, you know, are no longer in charge of the Labour Party, but there is a long, long, long way to go. Um, for the Labour Party to um, repair the roads, I mean, to repair, you know, the wrongs and to um, really address many different things, including, of course, um, uh, contending with the very serious issue of anti-Semitism. Um, and, you know, I welcome the report that came out from the Equalities and Human Rights Commission, which only confirmed my experience and what I knew to be true in terms of the discrimination that was happening under the, the former leadership and, um, uh, the harassment that was happening uh, and you know which resulted in you know, the, the highly unusual occurrence of um, the Labour Party being issued with a, a legal notice to act and the Labour Party's now come forward with 
a plan of what it intends to do. Um, but you know, that wasn't an end, that was only the start. And the Labour Party will be judged on its actions and what it actually does now. Uh, and while I have some confidence that it will be able to you know, make a difference when it comes to its processes, I think the, the, the greatest challenge rests around what it will do to um, contend with the problems with its culture. Um, and you know, there are, you know, there's been some shift in membership, but not, 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 not. You know, there are still people, you know, that, that remain that were um, involved in perpetrating the harassment um, and the discrimination. Um, and so there's, you know, I, I, it will be um, incumbent and be um, the responsibility of the current Labour Party leader to try and tackle that. And you know, again, I'll judge the party by its actions. You know, what happens will remain to be seen. I don't need to make any decisions about you know what the future holds because where there is not going to be an election for um, at least another three four years. I, I say that because the government's I think in the process of um, dismantling. Uh, the fixed term parliaments act so normally it would definitely be in four years time but that it might be sooner if that act is dismantled um but i don't feel like i need to make a decision i you know certainly there's some of my colleagues that former colleagues that weren't returned to parliament who know categorically they definitely do want to go back and others that definitely don't um, i'm just a bit agnostic at this time i don't feel like i need to make a decision and i'm just you know it's been a big big um you know year for me to come out of parliament to say goodbye to liverpool that was my home for 10 years and um, yeah, sold my home. Uh, I've moved in London and I live in Finchley. Um, uh, I kind of brought all my things down from Liverpool. You know, it's, you know it's, there's a big job to be done to, you know, to make, you know, to close down offices and just kind of go through that process, get a new job. You know, it's, it's that's that, you know, and, and to spend more time with my family, you know, that really has been my priority, particularly because of the pandemic. So for all those reasons, I kind of put politics on, on the back burner for now. I hope that answers your question. No, no, um, you've answered every question and just amazingly. Um, just a, a point of clarification, uh, is it Dr. Claire um, Gir um, Girada, um, is that who's um, involved, with, that was just asked. Um, yeah. one, one question, which um, maybe because we really are out of time, um, a person is in charge in, ter on, in their business as the mental health um, first aider. And although they've done the training with Jamie um, and they are familiar with some of the manuals, they're just wondering in terms of what other resource they could use because they've had people go to them um, who need support. And uh, is there anything further that they could um, that they could use to access for that type of support? So that's um, one one question. And um, and James also does have his hand up. He's been waiting very very patiently um, to, to to conclude. So um, after those, those will be the final um, questions, and then we'll wrap up the the evening. So, um, yes. And um, so the first thing I would say is in terms of, you know, so, so to be very clear, like a mental health first aider, again, is not a clinical professional. They're not a physician that, you know, they haven't, it's not, it's not medical training, but it is two days of uh, intensive training to better understand um, mental health challenges that people may, might be facing um, and to know um, how to signpost. Um, and those are two very important skills and to also to contend with some of the, um, um, unconscious um, uh, bias people might have or unconscious um, taboos they might hold themselves about mental health to break down those barriers. So it's, you know, if you get the opportunity, increasingly employers are funding this, um, um, you, know, you can through some places kind of access it for free or do a mini version of it. If you know you get the chance, I'd really recommend it. And certainly, again, depending on where you work, um, employers are putting on additional um, um, pieces of training and, and focus perhaps on specific um, conditions and particularly I think at this time um, knowing as I know some organizations are involved in this um, looking at the kind of three conditions in particular around anxiety um, and depression and, and looking at stress as well um, so um, again if you get the opportunity um, and there's some free resources on online as well um, there is something called Thrive at Work and Thrive at Work came out of the review that Paul Farmer who's the current chief executive of MIND and uh, um, Lord Dennis Stevenson did on behalf of the then Prime Minister Theresa May, looking specifically about how um, things, you know, how employers could play more of a role and and, and contend with mental health in the workplace. Um, and so I would point people that are more you know interested to look at all the Thrive at Work resources, because um, there is a charter that people can encourage their employers to sign up to, and there are kind of additional specific elements that um, can be of interest. Um, 
There is also, um, and I'm struggling to try and remember the name and perhaps Robert, I'll send you the details afterwards. There's some really helpful training that people can do that takes um, around half an hour and everyone on this call could do it. Um, and it's, um, it's, it's specifically to tackle the issues of suicide and how to, um, um, you know, what the appropriate ways of, of engaging and speaking to someone who might be, who might disclose um, to you that they have suicidal ideation, that they are, you know, considering, um, um, you know, in, in a, you know, they might be in a, in a very difficult place and considering taking their lives. That's a very serious situation to be in. Um, I'm sorry that I can't remember the exact name of this app training that you can do. Everyone can do it. It's free. Um, but certainly, you know, that is a real skill that, you know, I think everyone should have, should, you know, um, if you if you can pick up, take up that opportunity. It was created actually by the Mental Health Trust in the area where I was an MP. So Mersey Care was um, the trust that created it. It was supported by other different organisations and sponsored by an IT company to provide it for free. So I would definitely point people uh, towards that. And it was also informed by, um, and if you get if you get a chance to watch it, I'd strongly recommend it. The story about um, on Channel Four um, was entitled "Stranger on a Bridge," um, and "Stranger on a Bridge" um, was a story um, of um, how. And again, I'm sorry, I can't remember one of his names, but um, how one man saw Johnny Benjamin um, on a bridge um, and spoke to him and convinced him not to jump off the bridge. Um, and Johnny Benjamin's active within the Jewish community and is a mental health campaigner and does some really important work. Um, and the two of them together in the, in the wake of that experience um, have come together and have done lots of stuff with the Royal Foundation as well. And um, you know, Johnny's very open about his mental health. You know, he's been, he's very open at times where he's um, suffering greatly, um, including recently. Um, and he's, I think, a real role model for, as someone with lived experience, um, but certainly you know, the person, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name, um, who spoke to him at that time made a difference. And so yeah, that, that training is something that I would um, strongly recommend as well. And I'll, I'll find the details and share that with you afterwards. Um, forgive me, the second question. Uh, I didn't write it down. Yeah, yeah, um, James is going to ask it. So he, oh, um, he's so going to yeah, he's, he's gonna ask it. Yeah, is it, by the way, is it the zero um, uh, tolerance approach? Is that something like that? Is that, is that what is in Merseyside or is that Riga Bell? Zero suicide. Yeah, zero alliance, suicide. alliance, zero, yeah, zero suicide alliance. Yeah. yeah okay, I'm fine. Thank you. All right, James, do you want to unmute? There was, I thought someone just popped up. It was Neil. Yeah, Neil Laybourne, who was yeah. the, uh, just, just the, a man who passed on the bridge and, and connected. And the two of them now are very firm friends. And yeah, they, they came to, to Bushy a year or two ago um, to, to speak. And until until you spoke this evening, they were the, the highlight in terms of mental health awareness. So, um, right, James, over to you. I'm sure they're, they're still the highlight. <laughs> Good evening, Luciana. Um, uh, I personally, speaking only personally, I want to say I, I really hope we do see you back in politics, whether that's in the Labour Party or, or not. But I certainly do think if the, La if the Labour Party ever repairs its relations with the Jewish community, it will have you to thank, along with the JLM and those who really took it on. But you should uh, uh, really know that that was a a really special moment to know that people were prepared to stand with the Jewish community. And I think you made us all proud at that time. And I just want to thank you for that. Uh, on parity of esteem, what, what will it look like? And when will we get there? Well, thank, you, thank you, James, for your comments and your very, very kind comments um, and, and for your question. Um, in, in terms of parity of esteem, and again, like it, it's it's it sounds like a technical phrase. I, I didn't really like the language. You know, I regret the fact that that is the language because I don't think it means anything to to, to many people. And I find myself um, when I'm having you know doing talks like this or having you know panels with people that you know we spend too much time just even trying to describe it, let alone implement it. Um, as I said, what does it look like? It, it you know the, the principle is is that we treat mental health in the same way as we do physical health. And that means that, um, you know, in the same way that we expect uh, from a, uh, you know, pointed to like a broken bone for that to be fixed, it should be the same when it comes to our mental health. And certainly, you know, if you look at some of the figures for uh, talking therapies, so people accessing talking therapies, the um, number of people that will uh, go through the process of accessing talking therapies and come out the other side and then say that, um, they um, have received full treatment and have entered into recovery. 
the numbers differ, differ and it's kind of difficult, it, it's a bit subjective, but certainly the numbers are nowhere near where they should be. And you know, quite often, you know, we see numbers in the, in the region of 50% of people that will go, have gone through the process of being referred, having an assessment, starting treatment, starting a talking therapy, um, but yet only half of people at the end of it will say that it's actually made a material difference. Um, and so, you know, for me, what does parity mean? It means that, first of all, people can um, get a referral when, you know, as soon as they come forward and say, you know, I need to access mental health services, that there's still, unfortunately, instances, and, and it's, it is decreasing, but there's still instances where people struggle to get a referral. So first and foremost, getting a referral is really important, and that should be treated in the same way that you get a referral for um, a diagnostic or to have an x-ray or to, um, um, you know, to access a... Um, consultant services for like your ears, nose, throat, stomach, whatever it may be, that you should get that referral, that people get assessments in a timely fashion. So there's quite a postcode lottery. Some people are getting assessments done quickly within the space of two to four weeks. And um, in too many places, people are automatically put onto accessing um, almost like an assessment or accessing kind of like self-help services first before they even get that assessment. And I do think if someone's been referred, they should get that assessment in a timely fashion, um, you know, four weeks maximum. Um, you know, there are some places in the country where people are having to wait up to six months and that's completely unacceptable. Um, and then it's often, too, again, in too many places, the gap between having that assessment and then being able to start the treatment. Uh, and again, I'd like that gap to be as short as possible. So for me, you know, equality of access means that, you know, in the same way that we have a two week wait for diagnosis of cancer in this country, as we as we rightly should, and then forgive me, like a very short space of time by which after people should be able to access treatment, it should be the same for mental health. Um, and, it, and it also means that if people need an inpatient bed, that they should be able to access one. And should they need support from a, um, uh, a CPN, so that's a community psychiatric nurse, so supported in the community um, at home, that they have the frequency of visits that, that are required um, and they're not having to wait and they're not kind of, Again, there's, some, there's been some, some really uh, difficult documentaries where they've followed um, CPNs in the community and um, community psychiatric nurses are, with their caseloads, having to contend with, you know, upwards of 30 patients a week. And, you know, can we hand on heart say that those 30 patients are getting the time um, and support that they need? Probably not. So, again, making sure that when people are supported in the community that they get the time that they need and if they if people need inpatient care again that they don't have to wait for a bed and that they aren't discharged too quickly and if they are discharged that they're properly supported afterwards because so every moment of the journey and um, for anyone that might be you know need access to, to services and, and and certainly you know we know that as i said previously it makes such a difference to people's recovery if they're treated quickly so um and they're not having to wait you know the longer people have to wait there's no surprise that their conditions worsen and it then makes the recovery all the more difficult so for all those reasons again even if people aren't swayed by the moral reasons why it's important and they're not swayed by the kind of the equality issues or the equality considerations about why we should treat mental health in the same way as physical health you know even just putting it into economic terms and the financial consequences and not contending with it early on just don't make sense so again you know i, I would also um and, and i've talked about this a lot and written many articles and blogs about it um kind of point to early intervention and prevention um, rather than, you know, wherever possible, rather than treatment. You can't prevent every mental health condition, but certainly so much more can be done to um, either have nip things in the bud or support people early on or support people before things um, um, kind of get more severe. So that's a very long answer to your question, James, sorry. Uh, but, you know, that, that kind of gives you kind of like a, you know, a really full answer, I think, of, of what for me kind of real equality um, for mental health means and again it, and it starts with the culture it starts with how we contend with it as a, as a, as a country and I think we're almost there nationally um, in terms of our national conversation and again it's conversations like this that make a difference to breaking down those barriers and treating it um, in, in, in the same way as we do physical health. Uh, Luciana, I'm going to wrap up the, the evening in a moment. Did you want to conclude with any words? You say you wanted to begin with mentioning Jamie. I'm sure you wanted to conclude as well. And anything else before um, we we move to the conclusion? Um, well, thank you so much. I mean, I, I, you know, it's, been, what's, it's been such a far-reaching um, conversation in terms of so many different um, 
so many different questions that have been asked that we've covered so many different topic areas and uh, you know i'm sure there's perhaps even more as well um i mean, just to say as i began with there is support available um, you know, it, it might not be as much support as people need, but there's certainly support available um, and the other areas, you know, if people need it. Um, so Jamie's, you know, I would always recommend as kind of a first port of call as a signposting um, charity and also, you know, perhaps to access services if that's what you need, either on behalf of yourself or on, on behalf of a, a loved one, you know, be that a family or a member or a friend. Are they um, doing a fundraising campaign in the near future? They, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I should know the exact date, but very shortly. Um, no doubt through the power of social media, you'll see um, a fundraising uh, event that will happen. Uh, I think it might even be tomorrow, actually. So um, uh, my good friend Rachel Riley is um, hosting an event. Um, I think you can sign up online um, with Adam Dawson, who's the chair of the charity. There'll be lots of um, celeb faces that will be making a contribution. Um, normally there'd be a fundraising dinner. I went last year. It was a fantastic event, but obviously we can't do that in these times or charities aren't able to. And so if you know you do if you you know if you are able to contribute um you know, it's it's very difficult out there but I would urge you to do so I know that Jamie I've seen firsthand the difference that Jamie makes and the services that it provides that um again are, are culturally and religiously appropriate within the Jewish community and particularly for those people that need it so um but equally they've got a great website they've got a great web resource they've got a phone line and um, they're a great place to go to should you need that support um and equally, I mentioned again, I'll just reiterate Mind. Um, again, a fantastic one-stop shop really that can um, either themselves, uh, there's some fantastic information sheets, where to go, um, uh, you know, what to look for, you know, how you can um, uh, you know, support yourself as much as possible, but you know, how and when to go and ask for additional help. So um, there's lots more resources and I've pointed to some other organizations during the course of the far hour together. Um, but I would recommend those two as kind of first places to go to and just to remember again I just reiterate that you know mental health doesn't uh, doesn't discriminate and um, you know it's great that so many different places and organizations are doing things to um, engender positive mental health and um, but one in four of us at any given time will be suffering um, and so perhaps suffering in silence so I, I'd urge everyone to be kind and to reach out um, um, particularly over the course of these very difficult few months ahead as we are in our third lockdown and thanks for having me. Okay, well, uh, Luciana, I just wanted to to conclude the evening. We we have a, a referral a referral list uh, a list in our in our shul for those who are going through challenges of illness, and we pray for them. The Mishaber, the prayer that we recite, uh, just towards the end of it, just so appropriate to the talk that you've given. It. We we ask Ushlachlehem b'mehira refuah shleim b'so shachal Yisrael. The first thing we ask is that God should 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 send a recovery. Um, amongst all of the people, because it's important to know that, that illness is not something that you should be isolated in, that you should be, you should realize that you are amongst other people who also have challenges and also um, collectively, uh, hopefully, can can receive recovery and treatment. And then we say, refuas hanefesh, and then refuas aguf, that the, we want the healing to come for those who are ill of spirit, ill, mentally ill, those who are suffering um, from mental illness. And then we only ask for recovery from physical ailments because sometimes it's easier to mend a bone than it is to mend a spirit. And therefore the work that you, uh, that Jamie does um, in order to help to create a conversation that can lead towards better treatments and care, better awareness of the importance of having uh, positive steps forward when suffering from mental health challenges is just so important. And we conclude the blessing, may the recovery come speedily and very soon. And that's so, certainly something that you have been very positive about, about uh, not simply holding up your hands and saying, um, all, all, is, all is bad. There have been positive steps. You've been involved in a lot of them, but please God, um, there'll be even further ones coming in the near future. So thank you so much for all that you do and specifically for taking the time to come and join us um, this evening. It means so much to our community. Um, we are so grateful for all that you do and only wish you, wish you continued Hatzlacha Rabbah, only um, success 
in whichever direction things continue for you and wishing you and your family only well as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.